Awesome. Um, well, welcome to my Functional Programming Fundamentals talk. The talk is aimed at really anyone who's passionate about technology, um, but some coding knowledge would be useful for some of the later parts. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dominika Malinowska. I'm a software developer at Sky. I'm also a bootcamp instructor at Black Coder and Manchester Codes, where I predominantly teach uh, backend and JavaScript. And because I still have a bit of time left and because I'm from a non-traditional tech background, uh, I'm also studying a digital and technology solutions at Bax University. So my full-time job at Sky, uh, that actually involves uh, working with Scala, uh, which is a functional programming language. And we, I work on a data ingestion platform. Uh, so if you've seen the social dilemma, we are the people that collect your TV viewing data. Now that you know a bit about me, let's have a look at what I will be covering today. So the plan, plan is to talk about the various programming paradigms, the definition of functional programming, the different or main concepts of functional programming, and some of the advantages and disadvantages of using this particular style. So what is a programming paradigm? Really, the, the short definition is it's just the style in which your code is written. So using a particular style can make it more and can make your code more understandable and readable by other developers. And you your, yourself or your company may choose a particular style or multiple styles, uh, depending on the type of projects that you work on. And I've listed a, a couple of uh, different programming paradigms, which you'll probably understand even if you've never given, given it much thought. Uh, so the first one is the imperative style. Um, if you write in JavaScript, then you'll definitely know what that means. You really just write out instructions for, for, the, for your program to follow and execute one after another. One that's really popular and is certainly probably the most commonly taught at sort of schools and universities is the object-oriented style, which deals with objects and the sort of languages that they use that uh, Java and C Sharp, so really wildly known and popular. And finally, the one that I'm going to talk about today is functional. And you may have heard of some of the languages that use that style as well. Uh, Haskell fo follows the strict programming, uh, functional programming paradigm, uh, whereas language just Scala actually uses a less strict approach and mixes both object-oriented and functional. So part of the reason why I've decided to do this talk um, is because I've been working with functional Scala and functional programming for about a year and a half now. But when people ask me what is functional programming, I didn't actually know the answer to it. Uh, it's not something that uh, really that's made very clear. Um, I'd think I'd think oh maybe yeah functional programming works with functions sure but then every language has got a function so what's what's the difference so i did what all the de all developers do and i googled it and i had a look at wikipedia because that was the first search result so i didn't dig in that deep to start with and i read i read the definition and i actually got the definition here because i think it might be useful for everyone else to have a look at what the definition is as well um, so I'm just going to go through it and you can tell me how you feel about it. So functional programming is a programming paradigm where programs are constructed by applying and composing functions. Okay, so that's so far so good. We may, we're creating functions, so we already knew that, so that's good. Uh, so let's keep going. So it is a declarative programming paradigm in which function definitions are trees of expressions that map values onto other values rather than a sequence of imperative statements which update the running state of the program. Okay, if that made sense to you, then congratulations. You're probably too advanced for this talk. Um, maybe mute me, go for, for a little nap for the next 15 minutes or so. And for the rest of us who, uh, who feel the same as me, if that didn't quite make sense, 
uh, let's let's di dig into some of the main concepts and hopefully clear things up. So look, researching the sort of fundamental pro uh, functional programming concepts, it actually occurred to me that some of the internet experts or gurus uh, can't actually agree on a, on a definite set of uh, functional concepts. Uh, there, are def there were a few that kept overlapping and I've picked out the four main programming concepts to, to, or functional programming concepts to talk about today. And those are pure functions, immutability, functions as first class citizens and recursion. Let's start with pure functions. What does pure mean? What do we mean by pure function? Well, pure functions are actually made up of two elements. And the first element is that functions have to be deterministic. What deterministic means in programming is that your function will always give the same result given the same input. So looking at the example that I've got on a slide here of this double me function, all it does, it takes a number and it spits out a no number that's multiplied by two. So if I was to pass in a five, I would always get a 10. It does not matter how many times I ran this function, a five will always become a 10 if, if I ran this function. So that, and that's all that means. Deterministic is same output given the same input every time. And it's the second part of uh, pure functions is that they cannot have any side effects. So our function here, so this double me function, at the moment it takes one number, it spits out a second number, there's nothing else happens, uh, so there's no side effects here. But for example, if you wanted to, if you were having some trouble and wanted to put some login or get some or do some good old console log or print line, depending on which language you're using, then, then that's a side effect because you the operate you carrying out multiple operations, um, which have a different outcome than what what your desired result is, and that's what that's what that means by side effects. So, talking about side effects, you may already be thinking it's quite hard to write a function without any side effects, especially a complex function. If, you're, if your big old function needs to do quite a lot of things, how do you know there are no side effects? And that's one of the benefits of using the functional programming approach that your functions are likely to be a bit more simple, but we'll get onto that shortly. So I won't divert too much. So just to recap, uh, pure functions must be deterministic and no, and have no side effects. And just as a little follow on from that, I wanted to touch on referential transparency. Ideally, um, your pure function should also be referentially transparent. And the referential transparency is a mathematical concept uh, that I just wanted to touch on. So apologies to anyone who's still haunted by GCSE maths. I will quickly sort of skim over that. We won't go into too much detail. So all this concept of referential transparency actually means is that your function can be replaced by its value without changing the result of the program. And I used a simple mathematical um, equation just to illustrate that concept. So visualize this ex uh, equation um, as your program. So we'll be looking at x is the value of the program and this expression in brackets is our function. So, so three times four is our function. So the result of this, this program will be 14. And if we replace our function with its value, which is 12, the result will remain the same. So that's well and good. Seems quite simple if you think about basic mathematical terms, which is great. But when you then try and apply that to programming, you may find yourself thinking, oh, it's quite hard to write a function that can be replaced by its value and also be generic. So that's another food for thought, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. <laughs> 
Let's move on to the, the next principle of functional programming, which is immutability. The immutability principle dictates that once a data state is defined, it cannot change. So you cannot reassign a var variable value or mutate an array. A very common concept in other styles is a good old for loop. Well, a for loop is actually a big no in functional programming. And the reason for that is that we, that we set a variable, usually i, which we then increment each time we iterate through the loop. So that var variable is mutated. So we cannot use loops. But loops are so useful in, in many different ways. So how would you deal with that in, in a functional way? Well, one way of doing so would be to use higher order function functions or recursion. I will cover both concepts shortly in a bit more detail, but I will show you an example of what a higher order function would look like and how you would use it instead of using the for loop. So let's look at a problem. I have an array, an array of numbers. And what I want to do is I want to return a new array with all my numbers doubled. So in a different programming style, I would use the for loop. So I would declare an empty array and I would then iterate over my old array and push the, uh, the, the new values um, in, into it. And that's, that's all, I would, all I would do, but we're looking at a few lines of code. Well, the functional approach is to use, as I said, is to use higher order functions. Those familiar with JavaScript would, will be familiar with functions such as map, filter, and reduce. Uh, if, you, if you recently started to le learn to code, they have probably given you a bit of a headache to try and get your head around those. But we could use map to, to carry out the same operation uh, with a lot less code. So all we'd do is we'd map over our array and we would pass in a function of which tells map of what kind of operation we want to carry out. Um, and in this situation, we want to double each number so or multiply it by two. What, do, what this will do is we'll create a copy of the, of the array and then uh, create a new array that would be assigned to uh, to this variable map array. So our original array would not be mutated here, which is what we need under this immutability principle. And just to show you what both the outcome of uh, both operations would be, that would be exactly the same, except we got there with a lot less code in the functional way. So immutability is an incredibly important concept in functional programming. And it simply just states that you cannot change the data state once it's created. And this also takes me very nicely onto the next principle, which is functions as first class entities. All that means is that functions should be treated as values and data. So functions can be assigned to variables and constants, as we saw uh, in a previous slide. Uh, they can be passed as parameters to other functions, and they can also be returned as results in functions. And there is a... Apologies. Um, and there is, there is a special name for functions, which um, take other functions as arguments or return functions as their results. And those are higher order functions. And we've already seen one higher order function. We've seen map. We've seen how we pass in um, a second function as a parameter to define the operation we want to carry out. And that's where higher order functions really come into their own. Um, they are great to use when you don't want to uh, define the, the type of operation uh, you want to carry out until um, the program is executed. And I've got another example here of a, um, a higher order function. This time is the filter function. And all our filter function do is um, it's 
filters the array and returns a new array based on a condition. Now we don't have to, the condition doesn't have to be the same every time we get to specify what the condition is by passing in another function. And here I've, I want my array to return, um, to just re return a new array of numbers which are larger than five. And you could, you could use filter on just about anything. You could filter an array of strings and you can give it a word length, anything like that. So you can specify your own condition, which is what we need. Uh, so looking at the result, our original array does not mutate. That's check for the immutability, immutability principle. And two, our new array is created with the numbers which satisfy the condition which was specified. And finally, uh, let's look at recursion, which is also a different way of dealing with not having loops in functional programming. For those not familiar with recursion, it's a, recursion is a particular type of function which calls itself un, until it reaches a desired condition or it meets the base case. It is a very useful alternative to loops. Um, the one thing that we have to be very careful about is that we don't create a recursive function which calls itself forever and you find yourself running out of memory very quickly. The example I have here on this slide is actually a perfect example of bad recursive call because this function will call itself over and over again without ever stopping or being or actually stopping when you run out of memory and you see a big old um, error message. So we don't want that. So one way to fix this function would be to create, uh, to add a simple if else statement. So to define that base case and then keep continue calling the desired, uh, calling itself until we reach the desired condition. So I've created this second function, which has got an add and it takes in a number. And we can see that the, the first part of the if statement is our base case. So when we get to zero, we just return zero. We don't want to return, we don't want the function to call itself. It's in the else state part of the statement where we carry out the operation and we call the function again. So all this function does is when we call it, for example, with five, it'll add all the subset of numbers until we get to zero. So you can see here, it'll add five, four, three, two, one, and zero, uh, and then it would exit. So you can think about it as a, as a bit of a, um, as a break clause in a, in a while loop, something similar um, of how we would use, use recursive. So there always has to be some sort of exit condition. So recursion is a really useful tool, um, but you do, as I said previously, you do have to be quite careful with it and use it when it's appropriate. In some languages, it can be quicker than using loops. It very much depends. So that's one where you need to perhaps dig in a bit further, depending on which sort of tools you're using. Um, and it's worth saying as well, some, some languages uh, make give you tools to, to deal with recursion in a special way. So uh, in Scala, you can annotate uh, recursion and then the compiler will give you a warning if something's wrong. Uh, so that's quite good. Right, okay, so that's that's all the, all the functional programming paradigms, that, uh, concepts that I meant to cover today. Uh, so let's just look back at the definition. So I'm not sure, not entirely sure that the wiki definition is something that I would put in my own words. So I've had another stab, I've put in a definition. If someone asks me what functional programming is, I can give them that definition. So, so now my idea is that functional programming is a programming paradigm which focuses on using functions as its main driving mechanism. And these functions should be pure, deterministic and without any side effects. They must be treated like first class entities and they should avoid shared state and mutable data. Now that we know or have a basic idea of what functional programming is, let's have a look at some benefits of using this particular style. 
So first benefit is that it reduces bags. So looking back to writing um, our functions with our, our PR functions, so no side effects and deterministics. If you know exactly what your function does exactly, if you know there are no side effects and your function is pure and it always returns the same result, you are less likely to have bugs. Again, as, we, as I mentioned when we talked about pure functions as well, it's really hard to write a complex function uh, without any side effects or, or one that's deterministic um, or even better, one that's referentially transparent, therefore your functions are likely to be simpler, which also improves modularity. So you have smaller bits of code that links together rather than big old functions. As we've seen with our for loop and map comparisons, your code can be more concise, so less lines of code, which makes it more readable. Although you do have to be careful with the readability because it's easy to fall into the habit or Tempt or temptation really to make to have very little, very few lines of codes or very few keystrokes, and that's actually making it harder to read, especially when someone's new to, to the to the language. And quite often with higher order functions, you may end you may find yourself that you're nesting them. So once you go down a few levels of nesting, yeah, it's quite hard to figure out what's going on. So, so that's a, there's a constant trade off between being more readable and being more efficient. And as I've mentioned with, with recursion, in some languages, it can actually be faster than using loops. So that's also worth bearing in mind. But as there are advantages of using uh, functional programming, there are also some disadvantages. The one I've already mentioned is that your code, whilst your code can be more readable, it can actually be res less readable. As I said, it's, it's easy, easy to fall into the trap of using fewer keystrokes and it makes sense to you, but someone else tries it and it's like, whoa. Um, also, reusability can be an issue. If you are writing a, fun a great function that's you know, quite small, maybe um, it's referentially transparent, then it's quite difficult to make that function generic. Higher order functions help with that because you don't have to decide on the operations um, until you, your code's executed, so you can pass in those functions as parameters to other functions. But it can be quite hard to come up with, uh, with a generic function uh, that's, that satisfies all requirements and can be re reused in many places. And finally, as you may have uh, got sort of the feeling for, throughout this, this talk, uh, that functional programming is quite complex and I've covered the fundamentals, but there is a lot more to it and it is quite a difficult paradigm to learn, um, especially when you're new to programming. Um, it is hard. I've, I personally, I've been working with Scala and functional programming for about a year and a half. Um, and I feel that I've gotten an understanding of some of the main concepts, but there is still something that surprises me on, on a daily basis. There are still pieces of code uh, that I look, look at and sometimes just want to cry. Uh, but other times I find myself writing uh, pieces of code that satisfy all requirements. And I think, wow, this is great. Look at me, work of art. Uh, so there's a lot of satisfaction that's involved as well uh, in getting that right. So it really does swing around roundabouts. So just to summarize uh, the four main concepts of uh, functional programming, your functions must be pure. So they have to be determ deterministic and have no side effects. Uh, they, your data cannot be mutated. So Im immutability uh, functions should be treated as first class entities. So they can be assigned to variables they can be passed through as arguments to other functions and they can be returned as results from functions. And finally, recursion is a great tool uh, to use in some cases instead of loops. Right, thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, are there any questions? Thanks very much, Dominique. That, that was excellent. Um, I've got a question actually. Um, with regard to um, the fact that the functions, pure functions, uh, and 
you mentioned immutability. I mean, does this mean it lends itself to parallel processing as well? You know, you can have multiple threads each running these functions and it's, is, is that something that it lends itself to? Uh, yes, that's that's right. So um, functional programming is, is great for concurrency, which I'm sure will be covered in the next talk. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of a, a segue there, but it looks like a good one, actually. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know whether anybody else uh, has got any questions at this point that they would like to, to um, ask Dominica or whether they want to um, put them into the, into the chat. Hello, thank you, Dominica, sir, for presenting this way. So I think you tried to present it, to present it the, um, the part in, in a very agnostic way. So thank you for that. So, but there is one question I would like to know. Don't you think there, there is a particular business domain which is good for functional programming? Because sometimes people are trying to use it uh, for very simple things like uh, just gaffer a group of data and just returning it into a piece of JSON, for instance. So don't you think that there is a real use case when we can get a huge value from functional programming? Um, I think anything that really involves dealing with uh, high volumes of data would be would get a real benefit of using functional programming and the reason for that is when you stick to these concepts uh, there is far less chance of your data becoming corrupted or something going wrong uh, with with your data yeah okay yeah thank you that sounds good yeah thank you awesome Hi, Dominica. Um, so I have a question about um, how you apply mutability to, to to your applications when they're running in a managed runtime with a garbage collector. So for example, if you've got a system that's producing a lot of data, and if, for example, you're creating case classes in something like Scala for every single one of your messages, and there are millions of these messages potentially being generated every second, then in terms of mutability, if you're, if you're also mutating those messages, you're creating more objects that then have to be allocated on a heap in a, a language with a managed runtime. How do you how do you deal with that? Because at some point the garbage collector has to step in and garbage collect, and you'll end up with you will end up with some performance issues, surely. That is a really good question. It's not something that I actually know the answer of off the top of my head. Um, I would some, I would actually have to uh, research that a little bit further, but I'd be happy to have a chat afterwards and uh, maybe explore that further. Okay. Um, thanks, Dominique. Uh, there are a couple more questions that are coming through, but I'm conscious of the time. So I think at this point, um, what I'd probably ask is, is maybe if, if Dominique is able to respond to some of those questions um, after the event, um, so that unless there's time at the end, actually. But at this point, um, what we'll do is we'll hand over to Nick. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the top of the uh, top of the call, Nick is a senior software developer at LMAX, and he's going to be giving us a brief walk through concurrency concepts and how to test them in Java. So uh, if you want to take Control now, Nick. Uh, yep. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Everybody can hear me okay and see my screen. Yep. Getting some nods. Okay. So yes, concurrency concepts and how to test them. This is kind of a a whistle stop tour through some general Java concurrency concepts, some of the the tools it gives you, um, and how you can test some of the claims that are made and, and given by these tools, um, and a bit of why I'm even talking about this. So. First of all, I'll go through who am I? Why did I do this to myself? Um, what tools Java gives me to, to try and write concurrent code? And how do I verify my code is thread safe? Um, so first off, who am I? I'm Nick, I work at LMAX, um, LMAX Group. We're hiring obligatory link. Um, I typically work on backend Java stuff and have done for, for a fair while, um, but it's only recently in the past few years working at LMAX that I've dealt with low latency um, and large volumes of data and performance and concurrency a bit more. And lately, as, as a hobby, I have been maintaining the disruptor 
um, which is a library that Armex wrote. And talking about the disruptor a bit more, uh, what is it? It's a high performance interthread messaging library, according to the blurb on GitHub. Um, so if you've got two threads in Java and you want to pass a message between them, kind of shared state in concurrency is, is always the fun bit. Uh, so the, the, the disruptor ring buffer will help you with that. Um, it was written a while ago, um, I think at LMAX, maybe 2010, 2011. Um, obviously, I, I've only joined LMAX 2017 onwards, so uh, some of my knowledge here will be, be a bit woolly. Um, but the, the code was fairly well maintained, and it's used not just by LMAX, um, but it's used by quite a few open source libraries. So if you use Log4J or Spring Messaging, Solar, Mule, Druid, and a whole bunch of others, um, they also use the disruptor under the hood. Um, so async logging in log4j is a, a case where it's used. Um, and LMAX still uses it. And its main claim to fame is that it's meant to be quick. Um, so it, a ring buffer, you could replace it with a kind of blocking array queue in Java. Um, but that is apparently slow. And apparently the disruptor is quicker, um, a lot quicker. Um, and the code was maintained for a while, and the, the developer at LMAX who was maintaining it, he kind of left LMAX in about 2018, and he did a bit more work on it, but you know, other priorities come up. Um, and the code kind of started to just sit there, rotting away as code does when it's untouched for a while. Um, and so I took it up as kind of an interesting challenge. Can I bring it into the, the modern world? It was written for, for Java 1.7 was its current kind of source target when I got to it. Um, and I'm hoping to drag it into Java 11 and beyond because I hear newer versions of the JDK give us new cool things that we can use. Um, so let's use those. But this is the, the reason why I'm dealing with concurrency these days. But what is concurrency? Um, it's doing more than one thing at the same time. Um, so concurrency could mean running on one core and it's kind of time sharing to give the appearance of doing two things at once when it isn't. But parallel execution is when it's actually running across multiple calls and actually doing something simultaneously. And these days, everything has more than one core. Um, your watch, your phone, Raspberry Pis, your computer. Um, so almost everything these days when we're talking concurrency is parallel executing concurrency. Um, not to be confused with parallelism, which is how well kind of a task can be broken down into to multiple small chunks to run in parallel concurrent execution. And concurrency, like a lot of people think it's hard. Is it hard? Yeah, kind of, um, at least to me. Um, I, I, I didn't do computer science at university um, and concurrency, I find it quite difficult to get my, my head around. I thought CPUs executed instructions one after the other until the end. Um, but it turns out that's not true. And concurrency is very tricky because when you have two threads doing things and they share a state, it's incredibly hard for me at least, to reason about what order operations will happen. Um, and that can lead to data races, race conditions. Um, so my, my general approach when writing code is to, uh, to avoid concurrency if I can. Um, that, that's the easiest way for me to deal with concurrency. But it is the year 2021, everything has multiple cores, and CPU speeds aren't getting much faster. So if you want to go fast, you need to split your work up into parallel and concurrently execute. And then you're going to have some fun. So what can Java do for us? Um, you can make new threads and you can run code on those new threads and they can run on different cores. But when you need to share data, what does it give you? And the kind of first port of call, probably synchronized uh, and locks. Those are kind of Java keywords that most people have seen or heard in concepts. Um, synchronized is kind of a, an inbuilt lock. Um, it's an intrinsic lock or called a monitor lock. Um, which sits on every object that Synchronize can use. It, it also gives an extra little bit. It gives some happens before semantics, um, which we'll probably talk about later in the, the next slide. Um, but locks are kind of pessimistic. You, you're expecting your code to fight over some condition. And by using a lock, you're saying the, the area between your lock and unlock is your kind of critical section. And when you're using a lock, it blocks any other thread from executing that same critical section at the same time. Um, or you know what, whatever's whatever you're locking upon. So this is kind of cheating because then you aren't actually running this uh, this critical section in parallel. Um, you're blocking it so that only one can run at a time. That that's single threaded. Um, it's a little bit cheating. What can we do if we actually want things to run faster? And 
another thing that comes up in Java for concurrency is the volatile keyword. Um, this has been around since year one, I believe. And in Java 5, the meaning of it changed a bit. Um, but that was back in 2004. So it's a well understood thing what volatile means. And it comes up in many a Java interview. Um, and I interview people. And if they've worked on concurrent code, I'll, I'll typically ask them, hey, have you seen a volatile keyword? Can you explain it to me? Um, and the answer I get quite often from, from all levels of Java developer is this. Um, it, it means that the value is read from RAM instead of from cache, or it's read from the heap instead of the stack. Uh, this is the kind of answer I, I quite often get, and it's kind of strange because it, it's not quite true um, at all. And if you think about it, uh, I'm not an x86 assembly developer, but I don't think there is an instruction to say, get me the value from RAM instead of the cache. The cache is kind of a, an invisible thing in front of you that just makes things go faster and it's magic. Um, so that there isn't an instruction to say, go straight to, to RAM. And going to heap instead of stack, I don't know how that would really help you with your, your concurrency problems. Um, so m maybe this was true uh, before 2004, but it's been a while and it's not quite true anymore. Um, so what it really means is it gives you happens before semantics, which means if you set a value before, any value, a non-volatile value maybe, and then you modify a volatile value, if another thread can see that volatile value having changed, anything that happened before it will also be visible to the other thread. Um, and the way that works on x86 is you have your cache, but when you change a value, it goes into a little buffer, a store buffer, before it even gets to the cache. Once it's in the cache, all the threads can, can agree. There's a little protocol for that. But before it gets to the cache, there's a store buffer. And that is unordered because CPUs can execute things out of order. So if you have A equals 1, B equals 2, it might go into the store buffer the other way around. And then it might be applied to the cache the other way around. And the other thread might see it the other way around. And if you have volatile on B, if the other thread can see the value of B, then it must see the value you set for A because you did that before. Um, that's kind of in short. How do you find out more details? Because I've skimmed over a lot here. You can find recent descriptions online that tell you it's not something to do with going to RAM instead of cache. Um, you can read the spec. It's a really good spec on the Oracle website um, about what it means for volatile. Uh, and if you're, if you're really wanting to dig deep, you can look at the hotspot source. And it's on GitHub now. It's no longer in Mercurial. So that's nice. Um, and you can get to it. Volatile is quite good if you've got a single writer that you want to kind of set a flag that another thread reading it can then see the state. So maybe you're building up an object state and then you're setting a ready flag to done. And the other thread, when it sees the ready flag done, it knows that the object state is kind of finished when it sees it. That's quite good. It's not very good if you have two threads wanting to update the same value. So you've got two threads that want to update a counter. Um, volatile won't work there because an increment will first read the value from memory, it will then add one to it, and then it will write it back. Those are three operations. If you've got two threads, those three operations can intermingle. So they can both read a zero, say. They can both increment it to one. And when they go to write it back, they both write one, even though two threads updated it and it should be two. Is there something that Java gives us for that? Yes. Atomic data types. Um, what does an atomic data type promise us? It promises us a thread safe modification. And if you look into how a volatile, uh, how an atomic value works, say atomic long, it stores the value in a volatile field. So volatile is coming in here, um, but it has an extra trick up its sleeve. It's got compare and set, which is kind of an optimistic locking. You assume that your thread won't be fighting with another over this change. And it will be one assembly instruction. I think on x86, it's like XCMPS or something. And you say what the value should be and what the value you want to change it to if it is that. So in, in two threads incrementing a counter, they would both read zero. They would both add one to it and get one. And they would both say, set the value in memory if it is zero to one. So one thread will succeed with that. The next thread will say, set it to zero, uh, set it to one if it's zero. 
at the first thread, it's changed it to one. So that will fail. And then you'll have a little loop to go and say, okay, I'll try again. And I'll go and reread it, I'll re-increment it, add one to it, write it back, and that will succeed. And you'll get a count of two. So you've got kind of thread safe mutation um, by two threads. Atomic types are great for that. Um, how does it do that compare and swap? It does it using a thing called unsafe. And this is where the, the hairs on the back of your neck kind of start standing up. And you get a little bit, little bit curious. Um, so you look into unsafe, what is that? It's in packages, some misc unsafe or JDK internals misc unsafe. Probably warning signs that you're not meant to use it. Um, you know, short of sending off an alarm when you open up the class, I don't know what they could have done. But it's the only way you as a Java developer really can get access to things like compare and swap or memory fences, which are different ways of flushing those store buffers. Um, and so people used unsafe. The, the disruptor uses unsafe because it, it has a data type called sequence, which is very much like an atomic long with some extra bits on there. Um, and so it needs to use unsafe to have the same effects and same uses as an atomic long. So unsafe gives you um, lots of the kind of methods that an atomic would use, but you aren't meant to use it as a Java developer. And everybody who used it, it was a, a JDK implementation specific hack. So it might have worked on Hotspot, but if you ran it on a different JVM, your code might not have worked or might not have worked the same. Um, as of Java 9, the Java developers have gracefully given us something that is actually quite nice um, and made to be used, and that is var handles, um, which gives you a lot of the same operations. Um, so it gives you all the uh, fences and swaps that you used to have. It gives you some new ones. They're quite nice. It gives you access modes. Um, and a lot of these things, it's got a really good Java doc on var handle, um, so I'd suggest reading it. And if you're a C++ developer, uh, that's going to come in handy because a lot of the Java doc says this does the same as some C++ atomic operation. Um, so if you know C++, great. If you don't, you're then going to have to read some C++ doc. But it, it gives you most of the things that Unsafe gave you, but in a nicer, friendlier, happier to use way. So if I'm doing something like the disruptor, I've written myself a data type like a concurrent map or an array blocking queue or uh, you know, an atomic long. How do I know if it's right? But there are all these words on the internet and in Java doc telling me that a volatile value will give me that happens before behavior. But I, I kind of want to test it. So how do I know if my code is thread safe? Um, I can trust it and cross my fingers or ship it to prod and see. Um, but maybe I want to write a test. And if we're talking about writing tests in Java, unit tests come up. And if people are thinking unit tests and they're Java developers, they're probably thinking JUnit. Um, probably a bad idea. It's a really good tool for testing the, the kind of general use case and the interface of your library, like the disruptor. And we do use, um, we've got loads of unit tests using JUnit. But it's not great for testing the concurrency aspects of that. You don't want to be making new threads and putting sleeps in and a load of while loops to try and run them in different scenarios. These side effects are quite rare. If we're talking about two threads stepping over each other while incrementing a value, quite often that won't happen. Um, but when it does, that could be very bad for you. So writing a test that proves that that never happens or should never happen, very difficult. And unit tests, probably not the way to go for that. Um, if you're writing concurrent code, you're probably trying to go fast. Um, that's one of the aims of the disruptor, is to be fast. Um, if you're writing fast code in Java, instead of just JUnit, you might have another test library in mind, and that's a JMH. And JMH is the Java Micro Benchmark Harness, and it's made for running tight loops of code many, many times and seeing how quick it goes, which is great, but it doesn't actually have much in the way of checking that it did the right thing. For all your tests does, it just checks how quick it went. It can, you can add other profilers in, see how many GCs fired or how many cache misses you got if you run Linux and Perf. But for the most part, it's seeing like, how quick does my code go? It doesn't care what it's running and whether it's correct. Um, sometimes it might optimize your code away if you if you get it a little bit wrong and it'll actually be doing nothing and it'll go really, really quickly then. Um, 
So it's not quite the thing. If you're writing concurrent code, you probably do want some JMH benchmarks though, because the code that you write when you're trying to go fast doesn't tend to be the most readable um, I found. And it's quite hard to, to convey meaning in some of that fast performant code. If you have a JMH test, you can at least justify its existence. You can prove that, yes, this does look a bit ugly, but look how quick it goes. And you can say, if you refactor it, here's a number that's going to show that it goes slower. Yes, you've made it more readable, but at what cost? So JMH is, is a, a very useful library when you're writing concurrency primitives, um, but it's not the be all and end all. And here's an example of some JMH code uh, from the disruptor where I've got two different sets going on. So I've got a state, I've got several benchmarks, and these annotated uh, bits with benchmark, they will all run in separate threads at the same time. So I'm testing a little bit of concurrency and some contention, uh, but it's not really under control. And you can see that nowhere in here am I doing any kind of assert or checking that any values have been set to the right value. Um, I'm just shoving values in and seeing how quickly I can do that. But I'm doing it in two different ways. Here I'm doing a set opaque, and here I'm doing it volatile, because volatile it has a cost to it. If it if it had no cost, then we'd make everything volatile. Um, but it does have a cost to it. So here I can see with this JMH test, it will tell me how many times a second I can do this and how many times a second I can do that, and it kind of proves the value of of what I'm doing. Um, so that's what JMH is quite useful for. But it's still not checking what it's done and whether it is correct. So there, there's something that I didn't really know of before I started digging into this. And it's a library called JC Stress, or a framework called JC Stress. A JC Stress is written for testing concurrency. Um, it's used by JVM people to, to test the, the concurrent types we have there. And it does the kind of the coordination of the threads for you. Um, which is very helpful. Um, you can define outcomes, some of which are acceptable, some of which are forbidden, and you can also uh, define acceptable but interesting outcomes, which is quite interesting in and of itself, um, and it will generate you a nice report. Something I found and didn't know before was that some of the kind of memory fences that uh, the JVM gives you don't actually have any effect on an x86 CPU. So I, I'm running an Intel CPU at home and we've got some AMD CPUs knocking about. They, you can, you can not have those memory fences in and everything will work just because x86 is strongly ordered by default. So your loads are kind of in order. Um, but if you ran it on an ARM CPU, say one of those fancy new MacBooks or an AWS Graviton instance, it would break and for me, when I was writing these JC stress tests, I occasionally did have to run them on AWS Graviton to prove that the code I had written was correct, because theoretically it was correct. But if I write a test, I want to see it break, um, you know, by taking some code out and proving that the code is doing what it should be doing. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting tool. So this is an example um, of one of the tests that I've got here. And you can see this is like the atomic data type thing where I said, if you have two threads here, it's using an active framework. So there's, there's two actors and they're both calling increment and get on the same variable. So these will run in different threads and JC stress will coordinate it to run a whole bunch of them. And then I've got an arbiter at the end that runs and checks the result. And I've said, if the result is two, good. If it's one, we've missed an update. Something's gone wrong here. Uh, this arbiter will always run after both of these actors have finished. So it should always be two. If this was a non-atomic operation, it might be one. Um, and I can prove that by you know changing this to a regular old long and doing the same thing, and it, it will break. Um, so JC stress has proved to me that this atomic type is working. Um, here's another one where I don't have an arbiter. Instead, I've got two actors. And I'm checking that whole happens before logic of volatile. How can I see that working? Well, yeah, I've got a, a regular old long X and I've got a value Y, which I'm going to set volatile. So here I'm saying this is a volatile value. When I've set Y, if you can see Y being one, 
you must see that X is one as well. If it was not volatile, that, that wouldn't hold. But because I'm doing this in a volatile way, or I should be doing it in a volatile way, that should always hold. If you can see Y being one, then X must also be one. And so I can put in my little outcome here. You know, it's forbidden for me to see the value of Y, but not to see the value of X. And I can run this. I can run this on different CPUs. I can do all sorts of things and it will, it will help me have some confidence in my concurrent code because I've read the documentation, but it's quite nice to see it in action. And especially if I'm not actually using a volatile field, I'm using var handles run safe. You know, it's a little bit hairy. Um, another more interesting example, I guess, is here, here I've got an acceptable but interesting one because I'm not doing anything volatile here. I'm just using a regular old assignment. Um, so it is okay for some condition to, to not happen. And so I've got an acceptable but interesting outcome here. Um, you can see in here, it's, it's a bit hard to explain, but if I'm setting X and then I'm getting Y and here I'm setting Y and getting X. So they're kind of cross talking. And for me to get zero, zero means that I've done one of these gets and it, they both got zero. But if these are running at the same time, then one of them should have done it set first because the set comes before the get. So it can't have done the get without the set and it should never be zero, zero unless it's not volatile, which this isn't. So I've got an acceptable, interesting outcome and JC stress will generate me a nice report. Um, and these are the kind of reports you get out of it. And here we can see my acceptable, interesting outcome here. It does happen. Um, I can get things out of order and it, it's not actually all that rare. Um, JC stress will run different test configurations. Um, I've just got the default ones here. And you can see it looks kind of rare under test condition, uh, test config six, but that has a dash accent, which puts it in interpreted only mode. And I haven't dug into this too much, but I'm guessing if it's interpreted, it's so slow, the race probably isn't triggering too often. Um, yeah, that, that's the kind of output JC stress can give you. And I hadn't really heard of it before. So when doing concurrent code, unit tests, yes, they're good, but probably not for testing the concurrency. JMH, great for testing the worth of what you're doing and whether it's actually giving you the performance that you were hoping for by being concurrent, but not so great for testing the, the concurrency. JC stress, really good for testing the concurrency, whether you've, whether you've got the right memory fences in the right places. Um, and you can run it in different ways in different places and it's quite flexible and pretty cool. And so, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, that was my talk. It was a bit of a, a whistle stop, but, um, there's plenty more to read based on those topics. Hopefully if, if anybody's interested in that kind of thing, any questions? Wow. Well, thanks very much, Nick. That was a great talk. Another great talk. With We've had that. I don't know if anybody wants to put any questions um, in the chat or they want to ask Nick directly. So not a question, but I wasn't aware about JC Stress. So thank you very, very much for, for enlightening us that this tool exists. <laughs> yes, uh, I would say if anybody is interested in this kind of world, uh, the, the window upon it, which I got, was somebody suggested it on Twitter. Um, there is a guy called Jean-Philippe Bempel, and he retweets some really good stuff, including this, and Gil Tenner from Azul. Um, they are both great on Twitter. Uh, if you are interested in performance, um, yeah, check those guys out. Thank you. Any more, um, any more questions for Nick at this point? All right, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think I didn't really get the part when he spoke about the difference when you're using volatile and then unsafe. Yeah. So volatile is kind of a Java keyword that gives you that happens before logic. So if you've got two threads and you want to have, say, a Boolean flag to say, I finished, um, and the other thread sees that Boolean flag, and then goes and gets the data that you finished writing on, on thread one. Uh, you can just say volatile boolean, 
and that will give you that happens before logic. Using unsafe lets you get that effect, but even on a non-volatile flag. So uh, I can, because volatile has a cost to it, I might not want to pay that cost all the time. Maybe there are scenarios where I think I can go faster, but you know, it's a bit of a risk, but I can do it. Or uh, maybe it's perfectly fine in some scenarios. And so using unsafe, I can say, set this value non-volatile or as if it was a volatile field. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's why we're using or were using unsafe in the disruptor. Um, we have a, a sequence number, so it's a ring buffer, and we put entries into it, or we try and put entries into it, um, which means that one thread needs to say, hey, well, where can I put something in the ring buffer? And it gets a sequence number, and once it's done, it tells another thread, is, is the index in that buffer for you to go and get the data? Um, so that's kind of like a, a place where volatile is useful because in some parts of that, when we're going across that thread boundary, we want that to be a volatile, a volatile set. Um, but in other cases, we don't need to do that and we don't need to pay the cost of volatile. So um, that, that's what unsafe and now var handles will give you. You can pick and choose how you access your variable. It's not always volatile or never volatile. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Nick. Thanks very much, Dominica. That was terrific from both of you. Really appreciate that. Um, we're going to have to wrap the session up now, but uh, I'd like to thank everybody else for joining the call today and to let you know that this call has been recorded um, and it will be shared by RecWorks in the next couple of days. So um, you'll be able to pick up pick it up and take a look if there are any specific points you needed to take a look at again. But thanks a lot for, for everybody for joining and thanks again to our speakers. Thank you very much.